Why the hell are we taking him to dinner? <laughs> Fucking Max. Straight to Domino. <laughs> not even Chipotle well, first. I was say, it's not so yeah, easy. are we running? All right, guys, welcome back to the pod. Super excited um, about today's podcast because we've got one of my great friends, business partners, uh, co-owners of a horse, house flipping partner, failed Amazon business partner, Correct. crypto business partner. Also failed. <laughs> oh, is that one failing? I forget about yeah, that. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Patrick Niederdrink, welcome yeah. to Thanks for the me. pod. Thanks. Um, if you guys have watched any of my previous interactions, well, you've seen them on the channel, first of all, at the Flip House. We'll pull that up here. If you haven't seen the flip that we're doing, um, watch those videos. But um, today, we're just going to go into the ins and outs of you, uh, when you got into the U.S., and then life and your perspective on money in particular. So uh, let's go back a little bit. Uh, you came to the U.S. in what year? Uh, 2016, end of 2016. And you were a pro golfer, from what I know. Um, yeah, pretty much. Well, I had quit just a couple of years before that, but yeah, I was, that's part of my previous life. Wow, a pro golfer. And 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 how many times did golf bring you to um, the U.S.? Like, did it? Um, it did, yeah, I did a few times. I mean, definitely the very first time I came, it was a friend of mine that lived here that brought me over for a couple of weeks, ended up staying two or three months, really liking it, um, and just kept coming back for vacations, golf, other stuff, and um, then met my now wife, and um, yeah. That's how I ended up here. Okay, cool. And Valerie, you met in Florida? I met her here in Phoenix. Oh, you met her here in Phoenix? Yeah. Doing what? Um, she was working in a bar. Uh, I was just a customer, I Oh, guess. you're just having so a cocktail. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Literally one and uh, started talking afterwards and, uh, yeah. Okay, cool. So um, you, you started doing golf. Uh, I presume while you're golfing, you're already doing other business-related endeavors at the same time? Um, not necessarily. I think I, I, when I after high school, I had some offers to go to college in the U.S., um, <clears throat> but decided to go pro right away, um, which is probably one of the things I would have changed going back if I could. Um, but I ended up playing pro golf for six, seven years. Um, did that full-time, so didn't really have much time to do anything else. Um, and then after I quit playing golf, I kind of started looking to other options, um, the one thing that golf brings with it is good connections, right? There's a lot of business owners and, right. and good people in, in, in that sport. So I, I definitely had some good connections that I could leverage when I when I kind of transitioned out of golf into, you know, normal life. Yeah. And what year was that transition? Um, I first did it in like 2010, 11. Yeah. And went away from golf for about two years. Um, had a pretty good offer to go back to golf. So did that for another almost two years. Um, and then I completely quit in about 2014, 15. Okay. So then there was two-year gap between you done golfing. You're in Germany, by the way. Yeah. I don't know if we said that. And then, so for those two years, what did you do up to 2017? Um, I worked for a startup company in Germany. Um, yeah. That was, Max and I always figured we we're going to work on something together at some point. And um, we got connected to some guys that had a, a startup that was kind of about to take off really and um, they brought me in as a sales guy to try to like you know get get some more uh, business in the door um, so I did that for for almost two years um, and then and then decided that I was going to come here and that's when we picked a new industry and that we're going to start doing real estate yeah and and so obviously there's a lot of components to the real estate part um, Max seems to from a bird's eye view handle more like the call it relationship side not that you don't handle relationships, but he loves people. Yeah. Um, you handle more of the constru construction side, I would say. Um, so first of all, that it's just suiting your strengths, each of you. Um, when did you develop the passion that you want to, you know, do this, develop properties for a living? Um, I don't know. I think it's, I mean, obviously HGTV is successful for a reason, right? I think everybody likes to see transformation, see expensive houses, you know, yeah. cool stuff. And, and so... Uh, I, I kind of always kind of liked it. I never knew that that was going to be my, my job one day. I actually did over 10 years ago apply for an internship in, in L.A. as a brokerage. Um, and wow. they actually gave me the job, but then I, I couldn't get the visa quick enough, so I didn't do it. But it's it's uh, I always had a feeling that I want to do something with real estate. I just didn't know when or how I would get started. And um, when when I moved to the U.S., primarily at that time because of my wife, I figured, okay, that you know maybe that's a chance to start a new career in a new industry and so we pick real estate and um yeah i just like it i, I see the 
potential in it um, on the financial side and and again on the other side i like to see these transformations i mean you're part of you know some of the stuff we do now so to see that you can take something from this to that and you know actually get paid for it you know decently. it's so, crazy so yeah so i just it, it became fun to me and then and so i don't mind you know working long hours sometimes yeah okay so when i'm trying to think so i went into an open house what property was that it was on 44th 44th in mcdonald yeah Okay, so you remember the property. Yeah. I went in. You weren't there. This is how I met you guys. You weren't there. Chatted with Max. Walked around. Um, was considering Airbnb business. That was right before COVID, so then I got scared and didn't do it. Should have bought it. But Should have bought it, actually. Yeah. Um, Max was like, hey, my partner's coming. You, like, showed up in the driveway, then it didn't come in the house. I remember I didn't get to meet you. Then we went to dinner. So Max has been on the podcast before, and he he said that you were saying something like, "What the hell are you going to Dominic's for?" Is that true? Yeah, I mean, I mean, he does it. Like you said, he's <laughs> the one that you know does the relationships as far as like you know meeting new people or staying in touch or whatever. So um, he does it more often than I do. And then usually every he tries to like minimize it, and and every now and then he will call me. He's like, "I need you tonight. Like you know, we have a dinner with this guy, or hey, uh, next week you got to play golf. Like you have to be yeah. that one. I need you for right." So he, he like kind of like tells me when I need to show up uh, when it's really important. And um, I guess for whatever reason you left Flatter. the impression right, and, and he's like, <laughs> "Hey, I, I I don't know why, but I think we we uh, should spend some time and you know figure out um, you know how this connection could benefit both sides, or maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's a friendship. Maybe it's business." He just felt like there might be something, and um, as always, when he asked me, and I show up, and we had dinner, and the rest is uh, history. I mean, the best part about that was the crispy <laughs> shrimp was introduced. Yeah, yeah. The crispy shrimp at Dominic's. Yeah, that was a good dinner. Um, okay, so let's get into just what everybody wants to hear. It's real estate. Um, and I got involved in um, this Clearwater Hills property. Um which, for the people that haven't seen the video yet, the view's insane. That sold me. I'm, pres I'm assuming that sold you. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, so you can't buy that land. Right. Uh, I mean, the, uh, as soon as you find something that's that unique, you know you have something that you know it can have huge potential. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to kind of go from a basic perspective. Start at the basics um, of flipping a house. What components go into flipping a house? Like nothing crazy, just like what components? Who do you need? Who do you need to call? What numbers do you need to have? Um, yeah, I think obviously, I mean, it start with, you know, start with the buy, right? They always say, you know, make the money when you buy it, right? So you got to make sure that you pay the right price for the property. We see a lot of people that offering stuff saying like, this is an amazing deal. And when you dig deeper, it's not, right? So you, you've got to make sure you buy the right product, um, which could be knowing a good agent or a, a builder, a wholesaler, another investor. Like you have to have somebody that really understands how to value property before and after you're done, right? So those mm -hmm. two numbers have to make sense and have to be accurate. Um, you know, a lot of people start saying like, well, I can maybe do a renovation for less. You never can. Like, it's always going to cost more than you think. It's going to take longer than you think. Um, so you just got to be really realistic. So I think that's the biggest thing, having the right team around you to make sure that if something's off, somebody calls it out, right? It says, no, you're, you're wrong on that. You can't get that number on the resale. Or no, that's too much to buy it. Or, you know, like that's just the stuff where you need a good team that is honest with you and doesn't like tell you to buy it just to make a commission on the front end and they don't care if you fail on the back end, right? So mm -hmm. that, that's really important. And then after you buy it, um, like what's your first step of due diligence? Well, obviously you've already done due diligence, but like who are you calling? Um, yeah, I mean, it depends a little bit on the scope of the project, right? Like if it's a remodel. Yeah, let's start with, because I want to get into big stuff, but let's right. start with you buy a 1,800 square foot dump. You're not going to change the footprint. You're not going to add square footage. You're just going to redo the look. Yeah. Simple stuff. W who do you call first? Two or three contractors, you know, get them in there, get bits on it. Um, usually you'll see that two are somewhat similar and one is kind of quite off usually. That's how it is. So, you know, one of the two is probably more realistic. The other one is either like really low, they just want the job and then they're going to you know end up charging you more as they go. Or if they're like really high, it means they're super busy right now. They don't really need a job. So they just do it at a huge premium. Um, so, yeah. And then and it's all the same thing. You got to be comfortable with who you use. Ideally, you used them before. You know, other people that use that <coughs> contractor. Um, you know, and then depending on the price point, you know, an example you just made, you really try to like do as much as you can yourself as far as picking finishes. Like you're not going to have the budget to hire designers or, you know, superintendents or whatever. So you have to be really like hands on on those. Um, and then as you go into bigger projects, you know, there's a lot more to it. Then. 
Yeah. Well, one of the first things that you guys kind of mentioned or taught me originally was if you're going to actually flip houses for a, a business, you shouldn't do what I just said. You should always add square footage. In, a sim- in simple terms, why do you say you should always add some square footage to a job? Um, usually because construction costs are a lot lower than the resale value, right? So to, to make an example, we can build in a luxury space, I can build 100 square feet for you know, $400 a foot, right? Mm-hmm. But they sell for $1,000 a foot in Paradise Valley. So obviously every square foot I add, I'm basically adding $600 to my bottom line, right? So I'm just, I'm just trying to add square footage to... to make more money, but it's also downside protection, right? Because my, my, my resale value now is really big, but my all-in number is somewhat smaller. So if the market does turn, or if I'm off on my number, I can drop the price 20, 30%, and I still have enough margin on it. Right, the margin is the crazy part, because when, when you guys introduced me to the property, you were saying, going this big, the risk is actually getting smaller. Right. Because obviously, I mean, we know the numbers on the deal, but you could sell it for substantially less than it was under contract for. Correct. And still make money. Right. Um, so on that deal, uh, care to share square footage to start? Do you remember all, you remember every, all the numbers? Share the yeah. numbers of that deal, why it made sense. Um, yeah, that one, as you said, the view, like it's, it's a very unique location, right? It's guard gated. It's on top of the mountain. So there's a lot of things, you know, you would compare it to like an oceanfront property, right? Like it's a very unique, there's a very limited amount of lots in Paradise Valley, right? Know, yeah. in Arizona, for that matter, that have that view in that location. So we knew there is really no ceiling to how high we can go with the price as long as the product matches you know, what we're going to be asking. So we started at 3,400 square feet. Um, initial thought was to go to like 6,000 square feet, which would have been a, a smaller mm-hmm. version of what we ended up doing. Um, but then again, we saw the, the market, we saw the potential. We had, again, less, a lot of other people that we know in the industry brought them up there and said, what do you think? Like, can we get numbers like this, this, and that, right? So we, we kind of, like, tried to really feel out the market and, and saw that there's potential in, in going bigger and asking more. And, again, to that point, we know we can build it for four, 500, and, you know, we were selling for 1,500 a foot. So we ended up going from 6,000 to then 9,100, right, which, which set us back about six months and redoing plans, permits, but knowing the, the return on that investment, it was kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, 3,400 to 9,100 of yep. livable space. And it's called what? What's the name of it? I would call this guy 99. Why the 99? Um, it, there was, I don't think there was necessarily a real process to it. We started with sky because obviously it's high up, and then it's about a 90-degree perfect view angle of Camelback, and then we said, well, if it's like almost 90, maybe we can call it 99. It doesn't so have better. anything to do with a 99-foot infinity pool? It could be that it's 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 actually only eighty nine feet or something. Oh, it's eighty. You have basins and everything, so Got it's. It. But yeah, there's lots of ways you can make up the name, but but um, you know we always say the only number that really counts is the, the bottom line, right? So <laughs> I'll call it whatever you want to call it. So um, is that so far your like most favorite? What, what's your most favorite project you ever worked on, or is that it? Um, yeah, I mean that's obviously special, right? Obviously, it's the it's the the most expensive one. It's going to close just under fifteen million. So it's a it's it's, it's the most expensive one we've ever done. Um, it's it's unique the way it sits. There's there's other projects I like. You know sometimes it, it, you know we've we've done smaller deals, wholesale deals where your return on investment is like you know off the charts because you turn it around yeah. so fast, right? If you annualize your returns, you you blown away. Um, but yeah, this one is kind of special. But for the most part. They all have something that kind of intrigues you to, you know, like that project and, and, you know, push a little more on it. Okay. So that's just kind of like a, I mean, from a basic standpoint overview, that's what you do, but on a, on a very large scale. Um, how many projects do you have right now? Um, 13 in total and nine under construction. And wow. The other ones in permit. Timing wise, we're recording this when? Like December, December 9th. So timing wise, we're in an interesting spot in the market. First of all, what's your perspective on this? But are you putting more gas on, or are you guys coasting, not looking for as many deals right now because of interest rates? Um, so we actually, we when we slowed down last year, right? And a lot of people is like, well, how? why did you slow down last year? And to us, it was just, it was a good run, and it, it had to come to an end, right? And mm-hmm. we figure we don't, like usually what the market does at some point in those dives, right? Like you, it, it's not necessarily that it like slowly declines and you can get out slowly, right? Like usually it happens overnight and rates go up, prices drop and all of a sudden it's like losing 20, 30%. So we said, we don't want to get caught in that, you know, 
time frame when when it really like nose dives. So we'd rather get out earlier. We had you know five years of just going up, 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 up. We're good. We make good money. It's time to start pulling back a little bit and kind of focus on what we have going on. Finish those. Finish the projects. Take the profits out. Uh, we started going into multifamily, right, which is more like a long-term play. So the market change doesn't really matter as much. Right. Um, but but can we pulled out, and now we start seeing you know deals actually show up again, right? Like like we have people that have loans that come due on construction and they can't get refinancing, they can't get a new loan on it, or the new rate is instead of four and a half, no nine percent, and they're like, I can't you know keep funding this project. So we start seeing good deals again. Uh, you know, and as a matter of fact, we just put another lot on a contract this week, which we haven't bought anything since last year May. So that tells you like how long we've been on the sidelines. But now you start seeing them pop up again. Wow, wow, I didn't know that. So I want to talk about two different things. Number one, I want to talk about multifamily because you just started to do that. Um, And then number two, I want to talk about like some of the – when we sit together, not on a podcast, we've talked about a lot of practical stuff, like what you did, for instance, the maneuver you did on your own home I thought was interesting. So let's start with multifamily. How did that – like what is that? Is it your first deal, the one in Tucson? Yeah. Explain the structure of that deal. Um, it was brought to us again. Team right it came to us from a friend that we've known for four or five years now. He's an agent in Tucson, um, very successful. Does a lot of flips. Has forty some doors himself already, as far as uh, rental property that he owns. Um, so one day he calls us up and he said, "Hey guys, I have a deal here. That's it's my listing. I think it's a good deal. I know the owner, and they they got to get out of this deal before the end of the year." And um, so we drove down there and. and um, looked at it and said, all right, let's put the numbers together, see if that makes sense, put the numbers together. And it kind of seemed like a no-brainer. Um, so we, we moved forward. We used Brendan, a friend of ours, to, to give us the loan for construction everything. Um, and then Eddie's family, they're all contractors and everything. So his brother and his dad are actually the contractors working on it. So we knew we have a good team again mm-hmm. doing the work. No, they're not going to rip us off because you know, it's their son's money, right? Like at least half of it. Um, so that's kind of how we got into it, and and um, the deal actually got better and better as we went. Um, and yeah, so it's been been a good process. Um, you know, learning a lot about the ins and out about taxes and everything, right? Tax implications on that stuff. So um, yeah, could have couldn't have done a better first right. deal, obviously. And there's always a little bit of luck involved, but I don't think necessarily luck because we had Eddie, who's been doing this down there for you know six seven years successfully. So. It, it, the luck is that we know him, and he called us and, and trusted us as yeah. being his partners and you know working with him. The property you bought though had to be fixed up, right? Is oh that yeah. how you? Yeah, there was uh, a total of seventeen units, and there was only two that were still rented. Everything else was um, the, the previous owner were going to de- like tear it down and build like a high rise building on it, and mm. they didn't get the zoning approved and everything. But they'd already let all the tenants out, so it, it became worse to them. Um, so we picked it up. The one tenant they had paid about. Four hundred dollars a month, um, and now we're getting eleven hundred a month after the remodel. Wow, wow. So, so how does that look, just from a banking perspective? You go into something that's more, what would you call it, rundown, big, big oh, time yeah. rundown. Yeah. yeah. And then, how does that work? You ref, you you refi it after it gets like. How does that work actually? Yeah, I mean, this deal we can break down pretty good because we we. I mean, that's a buy and hold, so we're we're not disclosing any, you know. Um, numbers that anybody wouldn't want us to share. So we bought it for the asking price was about one two. We got it for one one twenty five or something. Mm-hmm. Um, however, Eddie was the listing agent, and we present a uh, represent us on the buy side. So we had another five percent commission. We could roll into the deal, right? Which which adds up. Um, and then we estimated that we're going to need about four hundred to five hundred thousand in, in repair costs, and it would be worth about two and a half after we're done. Um, wow. So one one in. Well, actually. Like one zero seven five in because of the fifty thousand and right five. roughly yeah five hundred thousand so you're like one five two five after right so how does that act? you you go back to the bank you get it reappraised you get the and then you pull out your initial investment now you're right so that's that's obviously the the kind of the holy grail right because now you have an infinite return you have no money in and you get cash flow every month right and appreciation and wow. depreciation right so the the way that deal worked is. Um, we, we get the loan for the whole amount of the purchase price and the construction, right? So we get a loan for, call it 1.6, right, to round, to round numbers. 1.6, they need, you know, 20% down. That's 3.20. We divided it between Eddie and us, so 160 each. That's all the money we needed to do the whole deal, right? Um, and, and Wow. So, so that's kind of how that goes, right? And now 
after everything is redone, we obviously went way over budget. We put it, ended up putting in another almost 150000 in repairs and cash at the end um, because we didn't want to wait for refi. We just said, let's keep going. Um, you know how we are, right? It's just mm-hmm. go, go, go. And then, so, but now it, it appraises at 2A, 9 actually a lot more than we thought, right? So okay. now to roll into a long-term deal, you need 20% down, call it on 3600000 right? But we only, got we, have, we have a million into that thing in equity. So all we have to do now is just refinance, leave 600, 700,000 equity in a deal. We get our money back and some, we're actually going to get a little cash out of it. And the cash flow is about eight, 9,000 a month. And, um, depreciation it's in the six figures eight nine thousand a month for you guys or for total for total yeah so one call it 160 in four thousand a month out yeah well no money in because the money came yeah no money after in. Year, yeah but still even if the money was still in you're right imagine putting 160 into something and getting forty eight thousand a year yeah where are you getting those returns right you can't and then it's six figure depreciation yeah that's tax-free yeah wow so Actually, that's similar to what you talked about with your own house. That is interesting because I think that's what's most tangible to like anybody listening to this is they're probably making some money somewhere. They're, that's what I want to do. Um, how did that – you don't have to share every detail. It's your own home. But I'm curious, on a high level, how did you do that? Um, it's crazy. Well, I mean, to you it's not. To me it is. Yeah, I mean, any lender you work with, I mean, you, it's basically an interest-only loan. So what happens is you, you're, you can um, – write off the interest in your home, right? Right. Um, where if you have a 30-year mortgage, you, you have a principal and you have a loan, so you loan the, your, your interest part is a lot smaller, right? To me, I don't care about paying it down because I'm going to sell it in two or three years or if I turn it into a rental, but I'm definitely not going to stay there for 20, 30 years, right? Um, so to me, it made no sense to, to pay a huge amount down, like you know, the principal down. So I decided to go interest only. I can write it off 100%. Um, which, you know, again, it, it, it's a, it feels like I'm only paying 60% of my mortgage because I get the rest I get back in tax, re- tax deductions. And then, yeah. um, I mean, the other thing is, is obviously the, the, the interest, the way it's structured on a 30-year loan, right? You pay 85% of your interest in the first five to seven years, depending on the loan. Mm-hmm. So really, even if you have a 30-year loan and you live there for five years, you also had almost an interest-only loan, right? So true. Um, that's how we see it. Um, you know, if you buy right, again, if you buy right, I bought my house, did a remodel. There's a lot of equity in the house after I was done with the remodel. Um, same thing. Pulled my cash. So it's out. like the same structure as the exact same. as the apartment. You you bought something that you didn't want to live in. Yep. You. I mean, you did you get a construction loan or you just use cash? Um, we actually use that one. We use private money. We call it private money. A, a friend of mine, a successful startup guy, um, he had some money that he said, I just want to put it somewhere. So he gave us a good interest rate and he basically funded the whole deal for me. Um, I took 12 months loan basically with him to do right. the remodel everything. And then I refined a long term interest only loan and gave him his money back. And that's about it. So I think the most interesting part that I want to peg into here is not your guys' ability to find deals, relationships, do good business, flip. It's actually finding money. You guys have an ability to find as much money as you want, and you know it, too. You can text yeah. your circle. There's money. I mean, for flips, how did that come about? Like Results. Results. Much. Yeah. Because if you texted me again today, hey, we got the second flip. I need 200 grand today. Right. It's already there. Right. And you could do that with how many people? 30, 40, 50 people? Probably about 30 to 40, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's because you guys have just done, I mean, such a tremendous job returning for investors. Yeah, we always, like, we, we have a lot of, out of those 30, there's probably 15 or 20 right now that almost text us every other week, say, hey, I got 500, I got 200, I got a mil-. like, what do you guys have? And we just tell them, like, we have nothing right now. Like, we'll call you when we have something. We're not going to take your money just to take it. Yeah. Right? And again, that gives them a comfort because they know when we do call, like we wouldn't call unless it would be a good deal, right? Yeah. Um, same thing with you. I mean, you're ready to do something else, right? But it, there's just nothing we can present right now. Like everybody's like, well, when you do the next multifamily deal, like when we find a good one, right? That yeah, that's be, what I'm in line for. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and, and you know, that, that's a long list. And then that yeah. changes the, you know, the perspective a little bit. Like we've been looking at, you know, projects like the one in Tucson that we buy between a million and two where we only need like half a million equity maybe at the most which that's a problem because you have this long list so you want to go probably your is your next presumably your next multifamily deal you want to be like what 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 
it's probably going to be by default maybe two to six million, right? It's going to be a little bit bigger. Um, mm -hmm. However, we also don't like to mix too many people, right? Because the more people you have in a deal, the more moving pieces are there, right? Like everybody's always like, no, I'm good. I'm not going to touch it for three years, right? And six months later, they get divorced. All of a sudden, the wife says, no, we're touching that money, right? So, right. That, that was my next question, actually. So, the human component, like, for how many are in the deal that I'm in right now? Um, seven, including us. Seven, including you. I, I thought there was more than that. How many have, as, as, have anybody, like, where you no. pulled it. No. So how many deals are like that one where it's like, I haven't heard a word from any of my investors versus a different deal? Um, most of them because we structure them that way. Like we, whoever gets in the deal, we talk to them about it before. We know, do they have more money if they need more for something else? Or, you know, is that all? Like, you, know, Going, somebody, you don't want to go all in. Yeah, usually if somebody comes in and says, oh, can, you know, can I maybe put in 25, right? Like to us, it's a little bit, depending on who it is, a little bit of a red flag because if they only have 45 in their bank account, they shouldn't give us 25. Yeah, because the car breaks down, the dishwasher goes out, and all of a sudden they're like, "I'm a little tight. Can I get five back?" Like, right. you know, so that happens, and and that's why we we like to plan accordingly, depending on the size of the project, uh, turnaround time, everything. So we're trying to put the right people in the right deal, um, and and that's you know even if we do a bigger deal, we would structure it to where it's bigger amounts, fewer people, and then again we might bring one or two people in that do a little bit less to get them in the door right so they can see how we work and kind of build up with them right where you see the potential yeah because that's what when we when max and i were chatting it was like i mean when you think about the time i met you guys in uh december of 2019 and i believe we closed on that thing in july of 2020 so i don't remember when i had to get the money over but it was like may or june yeah somewhere so i know these two germans for five months and i just wire them money i mean uh, for all I know, it's gone. Forget right. about it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that there is, to some extent, the longer you go, the less it's worried about um, people like testing the waters. But to some extent, you still have to test yeah. the waters. Right. You're not, you know, I wasn't going to give you guys my entire bank account right. for all I know. And we wouldn't have taken it either because, right. we d again, we don't know, right? If you say, I'll give you 500 and we're like, mm, you know, like looking at everything around the guy, I don't think that's, you know, yeah, little, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. all he has type of thing, right? Like he just sees returns and he puts all his money in because that tells us there's a chance that he might call us saying, like, I need my money out or I changed my mind, right? Um, so if you were to call us on that deal and say, I, I got to get out, that's an amount that either Max or I or one other investor can take over, right? Like without making it a big deal, right? If somebody has a million in there and wants to walk. It's I, hard. Nobody has a million laying around that it can, you know, put back in the next morning, right? So that's why it's it's all about finding the right people for the right deals and making sure both sides are comfortable with the amounts putting in, right? Yeah. So interesting what you guys are doing. So where do you see this? It seems to me you guys are moving more and more every week, every month, every year into development than it is general real estate transactions, even though you guys still have a phenomenal brokerage. Um, like where do you see this ship heading? What are you trying to accomplish? Where are you going? I know Florida now. Yeah, I think I think um, yeah the brokerage the brokerage itself. I mean, we went from the growth of the last years. It was from three million to sixty million to one thirty to now probably close to two hundred fifty million this year. So it, it's been wow. growing at a consistent pace. Um, so that's not going to go anywhere. Like we're, we're always going to do that. Max and I, my numbers have been going up every year on the on the transaction side. Um, because a lot of times investors will like, you know, all of a sudden they want to buy or sell their personal house or they have a friend that just moved here and they're looking. So we, we get a lot of referral business from it. Um, so I don't think that's going to go anywhere. Um, however, if you look at how much money you make on a $250 million sales volume on the brokerage side versus doing flips for $50 million, Tons more on tons, flips. Tons more with, you know, it's a different type of work, obviously. Less headache, I would say. Um, different headache. Different right, headache, right? Different you don't headache. have the, you know, this agent hates that agent, that sort of thing. You yeah, don't have that as much. That's a subcontract that doesn't work with that guy and this okay. guy and that neighbor calls the cops on you because they turned on the jackhammer of 702 instead of 730 in the HRA. Like, it's just, there's always something, right? And you always say you get paid based on the problems you deal with, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's truth to that. Like, there's a lot going on if you have, you know, nine projects. I mean, I think we added up, it's over, over 90,000 square feet of luxury real estate that we're under construction. So there's always something, right? <laughs> And and everybody's looking to somebody that they con can complain about, right? It might be the subcontractor, might be the superintendent, might be the general contractor, might be the investor on the other side. On a pre pre sold, it might right. be the client, their agent, 
there's just so many people in that transaction that is an ongoing construction site for a year. There's always something, right? Um, and some buyers or some sellers are better, and others are, you know, more hands-on, like they, they need a little bit more attention. But it, it's a it's a different headache. Um, but there's different profits, right? Um, so so we do like the development component, but we also, again, we haven't bought a deal in, in over a year because mm -hmm. you know it's it's all about timing it right and doing the right things and. I, I think the biggest problem is to to do deals just to do deals, right? There's some people that just keep buying, and you're like, yeah. "What are you doing right now?" Like, you know, and, and yeah, I see that a lot with, yeah, like people that want to learn how to trade or whatever. Yeah, they, they they click it just to click it. When I when and I'm over here saying the best trade is no trade right now. 100. Um, percent Side question: What's the craziest thing? that you've dealt with up to this point developing a property? Like a crazy lady you found in the toilet, like the craziest thing you've dealt with, or is there any? Um, I mean, it, it's, it's like I said, it's mostly neighbors. I mean, we, we have, but, you know, Max and I would say kill them with kindness, right? Like we, yeah. we, um, we had, again, we had people that called the cops on us because they started two minutes before, you know, they're allowed to, you know, turn to Jack him on. So it was like 7 a.m. they could start and then you started 6.58 or something? Pretty much, yeah. And they called the cops right away and stuff. And then, but, but there's 44th Street was a good example. That neighbor called the cops on us probably three or four times and, and he came over with a shovel, like threatening one of the guys and, <laughs> you, you know, getting really involved. But, but, but the, the funny story is, um, it was about seven months later, Max and I listed his house and sold it. Like we the, actually the crazy guy with the, the shovel, crazy guy. but because we did the right things, right? Like we, we made a mess. So we walked over there and gave him gift cards for car wash Said, Hey, sorry for all the mess we made, you know, please wow. take those, you know, get your car wash and everything. We, after that incident, we called the cops. I went over there, gave him a gift card for a $200 brunch at the Henry and said, take your wife to brunch next week. Sorry for that early, like, you know, mm -hmm. that, that wasn't supposed to be like, it's a stupid thing, but you have to like, almost like, you know, switch side and be on their side, right? Make them feel like you're working with them. And and one day he, he called because one of the guys made a huge mess. Like they tracked out a bunch of dirt. And um, so he called me because I had given him my phone number at the point. So just reach out if anything's wrong. Don't call the cops, call me, right? Yeah. So he called me as a giant mess in front of my driveway, whatever. So, and I was at a showing. I was wearing a full suit. It was 110 degrees. <laughs> and I came over there and the guy comes out and I'm in there in a in the, in the suit on the street, you know, brooming with a broom on the street. And he looks at me, he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I clean up the road. I mean, that's where you call me, right? He's like, well, don't you have guys for that? I'm like, not on a Friday at 5 o'clock. Like, they're all home, right? And then he just looked at me, and he took the broom, and he said, I take care of it. Um, you go home. Mm. And that changed everything. It was After the that, principle. It was the idea. It, it was. That in his mind was like, okay, the they're actually nice guys. They're trying to do the right thing, right? So yeah. so that that flipped it. And after that, he came over. He you know, started checking in on the project. And he's like, you know, oh, I did this. Uh, you know, I have no guy that can do concrete for you. And uh, and it became like a normal relationship. And then at some point, he, he walked over and he said, crazy question, but would you guys sell my house? I mean, it seems to be a good time in the market. If, you're not, if you guys are selling this for 1.6, 1.7 million, maybe I can get a price and, you know, retire. And that's what he did. We sold his house and um, he retired in South Mountain. Wow. Yeah. That's a funny story. So out of all of the like stories, transactions um, I'm hearing it. it I mean, I, I guess I don't know this. What does your day look like now? They don't know that the stuff that I know, obviously you have Leo now, yeah. the little lady killer. Yeah. Um, Obviously, you're married. I mean, how? What's your day to day? How are you juggling all this? Um, well, I, I don't need an alarm anymore. I have a two year old, so that, <laughs> he that, got an alarm. He he wakes up um, and tells us to wake up. So um, yeah, I, I wake up whatever between I don't know, let's say four thirty and six usually. Um, sometimes I wake up. Sometimes he wakes up. Um, usually, Max and I start texting right away in the morning. You know, Max just goes to the gym at five or six in the morning. So yeah. we start pretty early. Talk about stuff that's going on. Um, then I spend about 30 minutes with my son. Like, I'll just get up, play with him, and, you know, do, do a little bit of family stuff. And then I get ready and go to work. So usually I'm on job sites anywhere between 6.30 and 7.30, sometimes earlier. Um, and then do all my job sites in the morning. I kind of have my, like, you know, loop that I do from one property to the next. Um, get to the office by 10, 11, 12. Get all my emails, all that stuff done. Usually during that time I get another call or two from somebody that I need to go back to one of the projects. Uh, we still have the resale side, so sometimes it's showings, it's listing appointments, mm -hmm. it's you know meeting other clients. 
um, and then yeah, office stuff most of the time. Um, you know, yeah. obviously a lot of projects means there's a lot of moving pieces. You have to coordinate, order, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so that that's kind of it. And, and then like usually between six and eight, I go back home. And sometimes my son's still up. Sometimes it's just me and Valerie having dinner. And then usually yeah. I'm like out by like nine, nine thirty. You're like that's kind of it, and it's just a twelve hour day casually. Yeah, every day. You do it every day, seven days a week. Um, five six days and a half. Now it used to be seven, and about like. Six months ago, Valerie kind of convinced me that I should probably start, you know, maybe not doing Sundays, full days. Sometimes I still do. Sometimes I do half day Sundays, or you know, I, I give her half day Saturday and then go back Sunday. But yeah. uh, for me, because the the week is very busy, like the weekend is my time where I get like I sit in the office sometimes on Saturday for twelve hours straight, and you get a ton done. I get everything done because nobody's at the job sites, nobody calls me, mm. so I, I just get so much done. I just need that time, right? Like during the week, I just don't have that uninterrupted time. So, and, and it's one of the things where I, we've been doing it for almost five years now, and I don't plan on doing that in the next 20 years, but I think if we keep going at that pace, you know, maybe in five years, like, uh, you know, I can go to like work part time and. <laughs> Which know. is 60 hours a week for you. <laughs> that, yeah, right now. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, the goal is to, yeah, the goal is to like take weekends off, like four yeah. weekends off. And, you know, so that was actually my days. question is like, Obviously, you're not working like a horse for no reason. Like, right. What What is your big picture goal? Um, Do you have one? Time yeah. stamped? Um, well, sooner than later, right? Like, there's yeah. no like specific time. Um, I I think, I think it's more you know how everybody always said it's more about the freedom, right? I'd be, uh, it, I would like to be able to just not have to go to work this week if I don't want to, or if my Family says, let's go go to Disneyland for the week, not have to think about can I or can I not, right? Like set up the businesses to where we can leave and they still work, uh, which I think we made a huge, huge progress the last two years on that end. Um, and then the other thing is obviously a financial component, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you go to like the Pole Express, it's like a 90 minute train ride and costs you like $700, right? Like everything has gotten ridiculously expensive, totally. right? Like it's, it's so to be able to do that, you know, and there's always something, right? And picture was standing for 75 bucks. And <laughs> it's just like everything just gotten like out of control, I think, right? On the on the sales side. And then, you know, I might buy a shoe here and there. So oh. it, it just adds up, right? So to might. Me, yeah, might. <laughs> might. Might. We won't go down um, that path. But yeah, so I, it's just to me, it's just like, yeah, life is expensive. So totally. I want to get to a point where I have a, a number per month that I know I can, like, I don't have to worry about anything. It's coming. It's, yeah. it's coming. And, there's another reserve of, you know, if it's not coming, like, that's to me where I want to get to. That doesn't mean I'm going to stop working at that point, but it, it means if I want to go to Europe for four weeks and just do nothing with my family, I can to just have that option. Is the vehicle to get there multifamily? I think it's a big part of it, yeah, because yeah. it creates passive income. Um, yeah, I'm still just blown away by the, I mean, the, that structure of a deal. Like, yeah, $4,000, give or take cash flow every month off of now no money in but call right. it 160 is just i mean it, no money in it's yeah it, i mean four thousand dollars a month for most people as you know is a full-time job right. and that's mailbox money now yeah the, the other thing is you know like it, there's two different ways on doing it you got to remember like when max and i started we had like no money right like we couldn't have just put fifty thousand in a flip or something like we, mm -hmm. we didn't have the money to do any of that stuff so it's not necessarily that you can do that same deal with zero money because the deal made so much sense on, on paper. Like yeah, everything somebody will so take good. It. I could have gone to like 20 different people and say, can you give me 150000 I'll pay you 20% of your money and you get your money back in 12 months. Mm -hmm. They look at the numbers. They see that upside. They know it's a no-brainer. They're going to be in first position, whatever, right? If, if I default, they're going to take over property that's 40% you know, upside. And like, if the deal is good, you'll always find the money, right? To your point earlier, there's so many people we can call. Like, could I, if I if we had a good deal, we could probably raise 20 million tomorrow. But if it's a shitty deal, we're not even going to get 50, right? Because most people are so educated that we work with that they would call, like, that's not a good deal. I'm not, like, you know, that's that's the thing. Like, if you have a good deal, the money is the easiest thing in the world. There's, there's more money than there's deals. Yeah. Right? So that's... So... <laughs> You came here with not that much money, no. fifty thousand. Max and I had combined about eighty-eight thousand. We put into a little townhouse. That yeah, was like all in. 
yeah, when I moved here, I moved in with like Valerie, and that was a 700 square foot one bedroom apartment for 650. Right. Months. Which I feel like majority of the time, folks listening to, I, I shouldn't say that, that sounds bad. Um, some people listening to the podcast might be in a position where they have a lower income, don't have a lot of cash reserves. How, how do you flip that switch? First of all, I believe it comes in the form of sales. I think you got to go sell something. Yeah. Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, you have to be able to sell yeah. yourself, the product, whatever it is. So getting there's two avenues to it. Getting going, what do you say is like the biggest pieces of advice? You got to go sell more. Yeah. Like what's your piece of advice there other than internal drive and motivation? I, I, I think it's consistency. Um, we've seen like so many people over the years that they come, they go, or they work really hard for two months and then they disappear for months and then they do a different industry, they come back, right? And and Max and I have been the ones that like have blinders on and just like, no, we're going to make this happen. Right? Mm. And, and in our industry, sometimes you don't make money for two or three months, right? It's the same with like solar sales. Every sales, if you have a strict sales position, you never know when the next check's going to come in. And if it's going to be five grand or 50, you just don't know, right? Yeah. The more, the more you do, the better you can predict it, right? If I have so much in the pipeline, something's going to click. But I don't know how much or when, right? If I do less, then I don't even know if anything's going to actually come to fruition, right? So I think the consistency and, and, and staying focused on one thing, and even if the money's not coming in, just trust the process. Like the second you, you get like sidetracked, you do something else because you think, oh, you know, my buddy's whatever doing this and I can, you know, help him and I'll make an extra five grand the next month doing this. But it actually set you back fifty grand on your main business because you lost focus, you lost momentum, you lost yeah. connection to opportunities and everything. So I think that's the one thing that Max and I did different than anybody that we've came across the last six years. It's like we're so focused since the first day we came here and we decided literally when we came, we said, Okay, we're gonna do real estate. We're gonna put every penny we have, except for like maybe five grand to pay a little bit of living costs for the next three months into real estate and we'll make it work. Mm-hmm. And we've never changed that. It's still to this day, everything we do, we focus around real estate, right? If we invest in something else, it's because money came out of real estate, we want to put it somewhere, right? The racehorse, the <laughs> I was crypto, just going to say, like horses. The horses, the crypto, <laughs> the Amazon, right? It's stuff where we've, we've seen people that said, okay, Amazon, right? And all of a sudden, they went like, they're thinking that's the holy grail and they're going to make billions of dollars doing it, right? Yeah. Th- that's That was never our intention. Our intention when we said it was like, yeah, let's just throw some money at it and see if something comes out of it, right? Like right. For us, it was a different approach and we had people that were agents that were started to doing good and then they turned into the e-commerce guy. Did that for three or four months. It didn't lead to anything. Came back to real estate but had to start at zero again. All their leads were gone. Yeah. They were all moved on to other agents and other properties and everything. I think that's yeah. the biggest thing. Like people get, you know, shiny object or think they can make more money or quicker money or, you know, and, and there's always people that come to us and say, well, you know, but I got to pay my bills. So did we... We yeah. figured it out, right? Like if we, like if, if I didn't know when the next commission comes in, the only way for me to guarantee a commission back then was if I find a deal that's so good that somebody's going to want to do it. So I had to create the opportunity, sell that to somebody, and I would get a commission. Yeah. Right? I, I can't wait for somebody to call me, right? And I think that's the same in everything. So that's the, but we never changed the focus. We said, okay, we need to make money. Yes, we have to pay bills, but it's got to come from real estate. Uh, got to figure out how we're not yep. starting another job or we're not doing any side business 110 percent focused 120 hours a week it. on the same thing well i think staying hyper focused not changing um whatever you want to call it vehicles so if i'm going to do real estate i'm just going to do real estate is the most important but i think there's a there's a second component that most people don't realize i see it in solar so these guys will start oh i'm the door knocking guy and then they see you know this rep having success virtually, so then suddenly they're like, well, I'm no longer going to knock doors, even though they've just made 150 grand their first year knocking doors. Oh, well, he does virtual, so I'm going to go do virtual. Yeah. And it's almost, they're in the same industry, but now it's the same thing. Now they're just, now they have to go relearn the cycle. Now it's another 12 months, yeah. and it causes them to go backwards. Yeah. Um, so that, that could be a double-edged sword. The second question that I asked Max on a previous podcast was, now you're making money. Let's... Imagine you're a sales rep making whatever, 20, 30, 40, 50 grand a month, whatever it is. How do you stay motivated? How do you stay motivated to keep going? Um, I, I think being in the right circle, hanging out, hanging out with the right people, right? Like if you, if, if, you know, you, you go somewhere, like Max and I went on a vacation, we go with a friend of ours and, you know, he's like, you look at a boat, right? And the guy's like, what, 275? That's not bad. And, and our mind is like, 
it's a lot of money for a boat, right? Like <laughs> considering we live in Arizona, where you're not, you know, you're not going to use it much, right? Yeah. Um, so it changed your mind. You're like, okay, like I want to be able to say that at one point. Like, right? You, you kind of, you know, if you hang out with the same people, you always hang out, and they just bought a brand new BMW for forty five thousand. You made that in two weeks. That's not going to push you to do more. You're like, yeah, I can buy that car next month. Mm-hmm. Right? So you, you kind of like the, the people you hang out with, the stuff that they do, the stuff that you see makes you realize that 50 is actually not that much, right? Like it, it's a lot to a lot of people and it's almost nothing to a lot of people, right? That's why yeah. I always say there's more money than, than, you know, than you can think of. So it's, it's really like a, a mindset of, okay, is it really that much? Like, you know, like I said, life is expensive. Like, is, is that a lot? Or, you know, do you see a new car and you be you know, able to buy it or... You know, and I think the other thing is a lot of people like spend the money as they make it, right? So they don't work on growing their their their, their net worth by putting into deals or putting it elsewhere, like spending it on on daily you know yeah. activities that doesn't there's no return on that money. Well, I think it's a big one because on 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 the Instagrams of the world, everybody's always saying cash is trash. You got to invest your money, got it, which is true. But whoever got rich, or as you say, moved the needle off of a five thousand dollar investment, you have to actually have a significant, you know, yeah. sitting cash reserve savings account of money to go make something happen. Yeah, and to time it right, right? Like if something pops up, right? Like if, again, if there's a good deal, you want to be able to, to make something happen, right? You don't want to miss out on a good deal because you can't, you have no money on the sideline or something that you can deploy to the deal, right? Um, so I think there's there's different, different ways to do it. Um, you, yeah, you don't want to have, you know, millions in your bank account doing nothing. I get that, but you need some money ready to go. If somebody calls me tomorrow and has an amazing deal and they say, we need 200000 down, I want to be able to do the deal and not miss out on it, right? I agree. So you need some money, right? And it, it, depending on where you are in your career, 10000 might be some money, right? And to others, half a million might be some money, right? Again, it depends mm-hmm. on where you are in your career, but I think you have to be able to to access some a certain amount of funds if something pops up. And again, also, you have to be able to have a certain amount of funds and in case something doesn't go as planned and all of a sudden you need money. Yeah. You know, so. That's the so other. other than the investments, what other, I mean, I know the answer to this, but I'll let you share as much as you want. What other things do you put your money into other uh, than shoes? Um, well, yeah. Sho- for, so shoes, for example, is obviously something where whatever you put in is gone, right? Like you'll yeah. never see your money back. Um, is there anything that you happen to buy items that you like buying that uh, actually hold their value? Yeah, watches. I mean, <laughs> I we talked about it. that. And to me, it's like I don't, I don't. Uh, we're not in that game to like, you know. Yeah, I can buy a watch for ten and it's worth twenty tomorrow, right? Like we talked mm-hmm. about this. But to me, that's not the the plan. It's like it's it's uh, a I enjoy it, and it doesn't lose value at least, right? Like I it's can like sell a mindset piece too. Yeah, like if you look up a gold submariner from nineteen eighty five, right? That thing still sells for more than they bought it in nineteen eighty five. Right. So to me, it just doesn't lose money. So to a certain way, and it's something I can liquidate overnight, right? If, if, if I need to get rid of that watch because I need 30 grand, I can go to a jeweler tomorrow and they'll buy it back for 35 grand, right? Because they can sell it for 45, 50. So to me, it's like, it's, it's almost like a savings account, right? It's something where if so I, I really it. needed 30 grand, I, I can take that watch tomorrow morning. Like I would go with my ATM card to the bank, you know, and say, hey, I need you know, my money out. So that to me is different. Shoes, like I said, I know if I buy shoes for $300, I'll never see that back, right? That money's mm-hmm. gone. Um, and, and again, there's different things everybody spends money on. Some people like to travel. You know, I always have a hard time spending a lot of money on traveling. Just it's a ma- Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, to, because to me it's gone. You mean right? like hotels, or, or yeah. all of it? Like Yeah, like, Ma- like Max and I in that sense are very different, right? Like he'll go to LA, spend five grand on the weekend, have the best time of his life, right? To yeah. me, in my mind, I'm like, that's it's half. Gone. A, that's half a watch that I could buy. See, I'm, I think I'm more on your side. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's hard for me to go on a vacation. I can't. Remember, I, I've never gone on a vacation where I literally was able to shut the laptop and not be on the phone. I've never had that happen. Yeah. But I think that's more. I'm in your alley because there's plenty of these. What's that one up north? It's in uh, Utah, Amangiri. You ever heard of that? Oh yeah. yeah. It's like twenty nine hundred a night. I've yeah. really wanted to go, but at the same time, I'm like, man, like, yeah, like you said, my weekend is another root beer, or whatever I want to buy. Yeah, and that's to me. I just don't think I'm there yet in a way, right? Like where I can spend five thousand feels like nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, so it's like if I if 
if I go to LA and I pick a hotel, I can pick a nice hotel for 300 bucks a night, 400 bucks a night, right? Or you can stay at the Beverly Hills Hotel and pay 1500 a night. Mm. To me, it's like it's a bed. I sleep in it. Yeah. I'll be doing other stuff while the I'm 400 there. night hotels are not like, I like how you said that in such a casual way. Yeah. Like there's, uh, like, there's like $100 hotels. Yeah. 400 is very nice hotels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that, I think that's to your point. I think that's where you adjust a little bit over the years, right? Like the first time I went to LA, I, I stayed in a place where I probably wouldn't even go in that neighborhood anymore, right? Like, I, but it was like my budget was like, you know, 100 bucks a night. Yeah. You got to start. So, it changes, yeah. Like, every time we went back, we're like, well, you don't have to do the Motel 6 anymore. Let's yeah. go with the Holiday Inn, right? And now you're like, ah, maybe that's, you know, like, you, yeah, you, your standard, you know, goes up a little bit as you go. But again, to me, there's, like, a there's a nice, totally fine hotel, right? And mm-hmm. then there's there's the, the fancy one, right? So yeah. there's a lot of things to me. And the car, I see it different again, right? If I can spend 50 on a car or 200 on a car, the car is there's still value there, right? It's going to depreciate somewhat, but... Again, if I sell that car, even if I get one fifty out of it, my money is still there. I can touch yeah. it. If I spend two hundred thousand on a three months vacation in, in Ibiza, I'll never <sighs> see it's gone. Like it's a good memory. Percent. It's a good memory, but you know uh, that's to me like I, I have a hard time spending bigger amounts on something that have zero I get value that. to it. I think watches, um, like another component is we don't get trophies. Right. Like nobody's gonna come congratulate you. This is like. Watches, in my opinion, are kind of like little mini trophies. Yeah. Sort of, I guess. Yeah. I mean, how many trophies can you get? I guess, in your case, a lot of trophies. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah. I, 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 a good friend of mine that's a pro golfer, he was world number one everything, and they asked him, like, towards, like, his career slowed down, and somebody said, what's the biggest, like, you know, regret on your career? And he said, I didn't celebrate my wins enough. You yeah. Know, I, I won the U.S. Open Championship, and I flew home economy the same night, and the next morning, I went to the same breakfast place I always go to and went back to practice the next morning, right? Like, I didn't even digest that I just won something that's so valuable, right? And I think a lot of people, if you keep go, 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 right? If you have that mindset, you just want to keep going, you sometimes, people tell you, like, that's amazing what you just did. And you're like, mm-hmm. I didn't feel like it. Because the next morning, I was already so back into the mode. So I think, yeah, I think watches, cars, certain things can be, can be something that remind you of okay you're actually doing well like you yeah you got here for a reason right well i think it's also it becomes you said it's so relative it becomes so numbing um i went to vegas i don't remember what year it was my first time in vegas the aria it's called like john george's steakhouse or Jean, and I, it was the first time i ever gone to a restaurant where i'm like yeah i'll have the steak potatoes corn and and i wanted fiji water because i said do you want fiji water yeah. And the bill comes and it was like twelve dollars per bottle of Fiji, fifty five dollar steak, mashed potatoes were twelve bucks. I didn't understand that whole concept. So at the time I was pissed at myself because I just spent three hundred dollars for dinner. Whereas it, it again it becomes relative. Now it's like if I go out to eat, I almost don't even want to go and get a steak unless I'm I'm getting the American or the Japanese Wagyu. It becomes right. like relative. Right. Um have you experienced that in the, I don't know how much you want to talk about cars, but you've driven and had some very, can, can I share a cool story? Yeah. So I get a, I get a text from him uh, after I closed on the house, very soon after I closed on my house. Are you home? Yes. Come outside. And I come outside, nobody's outside. And then I just hear this noise and comes around like an Aventador or something. I can't remember what you had just bought. And we whipped it around. Um, I'm curious on those, like, have you actually ever, do, do you make, is there a, a monetary gain in owning a very expensive, like Lambo like that? Um, I mean, we had, we had two and we were lucky in both of them, but that was just because of the market, you know, like yeah. we, we sold both of them for more than we bought them for. Um, however, that's, that's making it sound better than it is because those things are very expensive in the monthly upkeep, right? Like insurance and, you know, like... What is it for the... Uh, like, people want to know. What, what is an insurance um, cost on Well, them? for us, it was very expensive because we didn't have a long driving history in the U.S. I think mm. it was about 1100 bucks a month. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, and it man. goes down after six months because now they... It, there's, they're called they exotic. trust you. Well, they're called exotic, so they, they value them different than any other cars, right? So they have their list of cars that are on that exotic list. Um, but I do think it... There's a value in you, you go to different places, you meet other people, right? Like like Max went on, on uh, 
uh, Lamborghini Club Arizona thing, and they do like a drive for two and a half hours through the desert right. and do lunch and cars yeah. and coffee. You guys have parked at like, like does that help business? Have you guys ever had a client because you had a Lambo? Hundred percent. You know I'm considering. Yeah. The thing is, he's trying to talk me out of getting a, a Euros. But. Yeah, the Euros. I get a different Lambo. Um, <laughs> I can't fit in it. That, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but but um, no, I think the it's hard to point at it, right? It's the same yeah. thing as again, you go like 100 miles an hour on everything you do, so it's sometimes really hard to to say this came from this, this came from that, right? Like it's really hard sometimes. Yeah. But I guarantee you that because of a car like this, you work with people that have the same type of cars, which have a different net worth, which Again, what we talked about make you aware of the fact that forty thousand a month is actually not that much, right? Like uh, to these guys, it's like nothing, man, that's right? it's like I'm under the poverty line, right? So that again, to that point, it makes you realize, you know, like oh, okay, we got the old one, right? Like they they all got the, the crazy version of it, right? And, yeah. And, and there's, there's always the guy that has one bigger and better than you and everything. So I think it's a it's a mix between, like you said, it's a little bit of a trophy that. You know, every time you open the garage door, it reminds you of you got somewhere, f- you know, from from having a $10,000 car, which is all you could afford, to now having that just sit there for every other weekend, right? So, it, but again, it, it, it we lost interest, right? We had we had them for like whatever. Almost you didn't, you had two of them, but it was it was both less than a year. Less than both? a year, bro. The first one, 10 months, the second one, pretty much exactly 12 months. Because you lose, again, you lose interest, right? You had it, you had fun, you made some connections, but then you're like... I don't like it's not it right and you get rid of it Mm -hmm. and now it's been maybe what five months without it and we're starting to talk again like uh, maybe if that pops up right but i think that's shout out tony yeah shout tony yeah (laughs) (laughs) he gets a text every other day from us um so i think that's the yeah it's it's like you said it's a little bit of a trophy so selling it and getting something else something different you know a year later feels like you got it again Right. Versus having the same thing still sit there and getting old in a way because you get used to it. Like it numbs you a little bit. Like you it's crazy how it works. I, I yeah. thought I was the hottest shit in town when I drove that Black Ranger over for the first six months. Like, oh, man, nobody could touch me. And now I literally don't remember the last time I drove it two consecutive days in a row. It just sits. Yeah. And I think uh, that's that's why, you know, and, and if you if you do it the right way, like, you know, on, on, on specific cars, that's why I'm saying not the years, right? Because that one, like, loses value as you no, he didn't it. say that he said but, he said the years yeah um but the thing is i think yeah these again like they usually i mean look you can buy a five-year-old lambo and it's the price that somebody paid for that thing brand new five years ago right like they don't lose really value so it's crazy you, so you drive it for a year and yeah you have the monthly cost and everything but again you're not like it's not as expensive as it seems yeah. when you really look at it because i've actually i've looked at an r8 yeah. uh i can fit in that gtrs i can fit in that Urus, obviously, I can fit in that. And when you really just peg down the numbers, here's what it'll be. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to learn. Okay, I'm not going to use all I, every other car. I've just bought all cash. It's like, yeah. Now it doesn't make any sense because no. there's some better plays. It's not as expensive as you think. I mean, it's expensive for maybe person starting out, but it's not as expensive as you think. Yeah, and, and again, it's a, it's, a, it's an investment in yourself and in your business too because again it'll create opportunities it'll get you into you know different conversations with different people like i, I yeah. totally see you know especially if you're in a sales career it kind of shows that you're successful right so it makes people listen a little bit more to what you do or maybe follow your advice a little bit better yeah um because they see that you got to a certain point with that you know so yeah. that, that's kind of what that does well the second component of the cars you guys have uh some cars on airbnb or not airbnb um sure. Turo. Yeah, Turo. How's that going? I I still want the Wraith, by the way. Yeah, I think it's going good. I, it's uh, it's it doesn't necessarily move the needle much, right? Like we we yeah. same thing we talk about, right? It's it's it makes some money. It it it's not life changing. As a matter of fact, we've been in this for thirteen months. We haven't even taken a penny out. That just sits in that business account and just keeps accumulating every month, and we haven't even touched it yet. So it it it's not a big thing, but it was more like the same as the racehorse. Everything else, like. We want to test different opportunities so that if we do make more money, we know where to put it, right? Like yeah. We know we're not putting it in Amazon, right? No. That's off the list. But, <laughs> you know, like, it, it's it's you, it's you a little bit of a test, right? That's why you, you don't go with crazy numbers or you go with something that's, you know, somewhat of a safer bet, right? Again, like the car we bought in there, it's not going to lose much value because of the car it is and it will keep its value, right? So, yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, no, it does good. And, again, it 
helps sometimes with clients. We had clients that fly in, they ask us for a rental car, and we're like, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. Yeah, it's perfect. So it, it makes sense, but it's not nothing where you get rich. Yeah. So any 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 plans, anything coming up on Patrick's radar, per se, right now, that other than you just got that lot, are uh, under contract or closed? Under contract. Under contract, yeah. I mean, anything coming down the pipe you see, or what do you think about, like, just the world we live in right now, are you guys being more cautious, more cash than normal? Um, I mean, honestly, it's like there's so many different things going on in the world, and everybody always says this is this is this is the end, right? Like that's gonna yeah. take everything and turn into shit, whatever, and, and then nothing happens. There's like, ah, oh, why did I like not keep like the one thing you can control is what you do, right? And and so for us, COVID was a good example, right? Like everybody's like not doing anything for three or four months because like, oh, I don't know what's gonna happen, or you know, it, we just kept working the exact same way. Like, like you, if it's not in your control, why bother too much about it, right? Like you have to, you have to adjust to certain things, but, but don't like overanalyze something to where you get so scared of everything going on in the world that you don't move. Yeah. Because I think that's the one, like the biggest, you know, like again, you, if you can't control it, like there's wars, there's inflation, there's, I mean, there's so much going on, but what does it change for me? Like I can still buy that lot, I can still build that house, I can still sell it, and. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like you have to keep going. I think ultimately, if you look back over the last 50 years, I think if we ask our parents, there were so many times in history in the last 30 years where they thought everything's going to end tomorrow. And yeah. guess what? Nothing happened, right? Like uh, Cuba. And th- there's so many crises and, you know, depressions. And in the end, everything's always fine as long as you keep going. So you just keep going. Just keep going. That's all you can do. Last person that sat in that chair that I interviewed said he's planning on building a bunker underground because he thinks the government's going to turn on us. What's your thoughts on that comment? do in that bunker by yourself make it very boring very quickly like uh, yeah that's that's exactly it like what what are you gonna do like if yeah. everything goes to shit it goes to shit yeah i, I like that because uh actually just they actually asked me a question that was like what do you care about or what are your thoughts on politicians and what's your i don't really care like the, i don't think we've ever even talked about politics no, no. you just keep it I, i'm gonna still do the same business the same thing i understand that if i vote Republican, it's going to help me on my taxes, and I understand if I vote Democrat, it's going to help with the solar business because they're clean energy freaks right now. So pick my poison. W- yeah. What's it going to change? Yeah, you know, um, yeah. Any any last thoughts for someone that's getting cooking, as you would say, getting started? Like any pieces of advice to say your younger self, what you would have done differently, how you would have moved differently, just different things like that. Like I said, mostly focus, like. Like, mainly the focus, right? Like, I, I yeah. think I, like, what I've been doing the last five years, I wish I would have told myself at 21, like, pick one thing and stick with it, right? Like, just, just keep going and start building something up, and you can always add to it as you go. But, like, you got to get over a certain hump in whatever you do before you can take a little bit, you know, off the gas and look for something else or add something to it. Yeah. Like, if you, if you, you know, it's, it's literally like that mountain you're trying to get up. If you step off the gas a little too early, you're just not going to make it, right? But once you get over that hump, you got a little bit of momentum, you're, you're, you know, you got something that's there that's built up that, that's going to help you in, in life. So I think that's the biggest thing because I've done it too before where, you know, I did this for two years and it started getting good, but then I got bored of it or I thought something else bigger. So I've done it before, before we picked real estate and said, okay, no, this more, is playing, no more playing around. Like, you know, that, that's what we're going to focus on. Yeah. So I think that that really is, the number one thing, like just, just you know, pick something and, and like see see it through. Yeah. Well, they there's that quote that's always circulating. The average millionaire has seven sources of income. Well, behind the quote is those people probably all started with one thing and stuck with it long enough so that they could invest in seven th- different things. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's exactly you know like kind of how we say, and and you got to find you got to invest a lot of stuff to find seven things that actually work and make right. money right like restaurants there's so much stuff where you make no money but you have to maybe try it right like we talked about it we came close once or twice so yeah maybe we just do a restaurant thing one day we'll do it right and there's a 50 yeah. 50 chance it's gonna go to zero right like restaurants they, they tend to go to zero or they mm-hmm. do really well right so to get to seven streams you have to you have to probably try 20 25 to get like seven good ones um and, and so to do that, you need money, which you usually get from your primary source of income, which that's yep. the one you need to focus on. That's the one you can control because we have no control over the Amazon business. I have no control of that racehorse. I, I think 
you know, can collapse tomorrow. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. it's not going to go over there, train it. Like there's Poor no Tommy. Don't yeah, slap, don't, don't snap your leg, Tommy. But you, but you know what I mean? Like there's no, again, you have no control over it. So you put mm -hmm. your money in it. You hope that whoever is running that business for you is going to do well. Yeah. Right. So the one I can control is real estate. It's the only business I know what I'm doing, that I know what to do on a daily basis to make me money. So that's the one I got to focus on, that money that comes out of this that I can start putting and trying to find my other six, seven streams of income. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's only three or four. I mean, Who cares if it's, if it's working? It's whatever makes you a monthly number that you want to get to. Yeah. Right. I love it. Well, thanks for coming. Love the perspective. Thanks for having Joining me. in the, yeah. the pod. We don't have a name. We just talk. The pod. Yeah. We're on the pod. So, guys, that wraps up this episode. Uh, comment down below if you have any questions or what you thought. As always, click the like button, of course. And, of course, subscribe with the notification bell so you get notifications for future videos and podcasts. We'll see you guys on the next video. Bye.